researching this, but it goes back probably about six months. And I got interested, um, I think there was a PBS show on the American Experience that they had talking about the great influenza virus of 1918. Now, I've heard about this, but I didn't know the extent of it until I started watching this or um, where it actually, they think, because nobody can still even actually agree where it might have originated at. And what was fascinating for me watching this was that they thought it might have began, or at least had some origins at Fort Riley, Kansas. That's where I was stationed at five years before I came here to Delonica teaching the ROTC program. So all these places they were talking about at Fort Riley, I, I, I know where those places are at. Wow, I didn't know this was going on out there. So I thought that was a very interesting aspect of this whole story. But before we start getting into that, what I wanted to start off with was, it's interesting because I got this off of uh, WDUN, and it was from April of this year. And I was talking about the flu season in 2018, and it said that one of the most severe flu seasons in recent years is finally coming to an end, but not after claiming many lives across Georgia. So even in 2018, with all our advanced technology and medicines, and antibiotics and antibacterial hand lotion and things like that, we still had 145 people died in Georgia from wow. the flu in this, just this past year. So it doesn't really matter how much um, technologically advanced we become, they still don't really have it pinned down what causes the flu and how this thing can mutate and so forth. So if we think of this in retrospect, 100 years ago, looking back on this, they didn't have any of this kind of you know, medications that we have now. So a lot of this, you know, they were on their own. And you know, they didn't have a CDC like we have now. So it was very interesting to read about what we would consider common sense procedures now to prevent people from catching the flu. And you know, a lot of these folks, they didn't really know. So let's go ahead and get started with this. Agnes, when you get done signing in, could you hit that light? It'll make it easier to see. Okay, there we go. It's like going to the movies. This was a popular children's nursery rhyme which originated out of the 1918 influenza virus. Girls skipping rope. I had a little bird, its name was Enza. I opened the window and influenza. <laughs> The title of my program is The Deadliest Months, The Influenza Pandemic of 1918 in Lumpkin County. And I love this picture because it's, it's so symbolic that you know, you've got this darkness and this death is just stalking the land and it's like unseen, you don't know what's causing this. A couple of facts that I've learned about researching about the Spanish influenza of 1918. Number one, it did not actually originate in Spain. The reason why that they call it the Spanish influenza was because World War I was still going on at this time. And Spain did not have censorship over its news reporting. The other countries, France, Belgium, Germany, United States, we all had censorship because we're not going to give away intelligence, you know, let the enemy know that this is killing our people and so forth. Right. So people were reading in the newspaper about Spain and all these people that were dying with this epidemic of flu and so forth. So that's why they just naturally kind of assumed, erroneously, that this is where it started at. In the course of the whole flu epidemic, it killed over 50 million people worldwide. And just alone in the United States, over 675,000. Oh it reached its peak between October to November, December of 1918. And as you're going to see, there was actually more than one wave of the influenza virus, but this was the most severe. Most affected were young, healthy people in their 20s or earlier. And there was a reason for that. Does anybody know? Anybody done any research or heard about this? Why? Greg, you shaking your head yes. You know why? The uh, immune systems were more active in the, that age group, and they say that that was part of a hyperactive immune system caused problems. That was part of it. Mm -hmm. Another reason that I've heard was that people born before the turn of the century, there had been previous flu epidemics that had broken out. And if you didn't die, from these flu epidemics, your, your body had developed an immune system, and so you weren't as susceptible as these younger people were because in their lifetime, nothing like this had ever happened before. And in Lumpkin County, as we're going to see, more than 50 people died as a result of the flu or complications of the flu. And now, why was this flu virus so deadly? Modern research indicates that the 1918 flu virus was a mutated human and avian or bird virus. Typically, human viruses, people can develop an immune to that, but when it gets complicated by having a bird or some other type of virus thrown in there, now it kind of throws a whole you know, new 
give her punch into it right there. That's why these people were not, you know, immune to something like this, and that's why it was killing so many people. Because they hadn't developed the antibodies. And the, I watched a show on this, which was actually interesting, and the way that they explained it was that if you got two boxers in the ring, you're fighting each other, you know, like if, if one boxer would be the virus trying to attack you, your body is trying to fight off this virus, and you might be successful in doing that. But in this case, the boxer, being the person that's going to get infected, he's fighting with his hands tied behind his back, so he doesn't really have a defense right there. He can kind of struggle, but, you know, that virus is going to get into you. And once the symptoms developed, in many cases, it killed within a matter of days, sometimes even hours. It just depends on how weakened your immune system was. If you were already sick, had a cold, cough, or something like that, that could actually develop into something uh, more serious, which I've read in a lot of these newspaper articles, that's what actually killed a lot of these people because they were already, you know, uh, sick in one way, shape, or form. There was no cure or vaccine for this virus because it hadn't developed, you know, penicillin hadn't even been developed yet there. So, again, a lot of people just kind of like on their own and, you know, in this time in history, a lot of people thought that they were developing a lot of great, you know, vaccinations and things like this, but they still hadn't developed, you know, something that's going to attack the cause of this virus. And where did it come from? Even today, most people still can't agree, but they got a, a few good ideas. And to understand that, we have to go back a year before, into 1917. Wow. Camp Funston at Fort Riley, Kansas. Now, in 1917, the United States entered World War I. So, this, all of a sudden, this massive call-up of men and materials and camps. We need to have places to train these men, to get them equipped, and so forth, in order to send them to go fight the you know battles over there in Europe. So this was one of the camps that developed, Camp Funston. It was right along the Kansas River. Not it, it was on Fort Riley grounds, but about three miles from the actual base itself. It was outside of it right there. The problem that you had is that this is what it started off as, along with many other camps around the country. This was just one of many. They started off as tent cities because they didn't have the actual barracks built up yet. The reason was is because now all of a sudden this massive need for wood men, you're competing with men who are going to go to the fight to the army, and then you got you need people to build these barracks right there. You know, it's kind of a tug of war right there with that. So they didn't have the barracks built yet. So you can imagine if you're living in tent cities like this, in the environment we've got groups of people from all over the country, don't know each other, and now you're confined in these germ pools, basically. And then this is low ground uh, in Fort Riley. That area behind you is where the river runs at by that line of trees in the background right there. If you get really heavy rains, that river has been known to flood quite a bit. So this is kind of a swampy area, okay? Now we're going to have mosquitoes. You know, it's, it, it's prone to have all kinds of different diseases growing. And so, so your sanitation isn't what it's going to be like we have now. Well, excuse me, but where would they, I mean, what did they use for bathrooms and they would just set up like like latrines. Um, you know, they have such small. Probably so. Yeah, that was one one. Well, they probably it. contributed a lot to the diseases. That it could. It could. There, there was something that they, they brought up later in one of these shows that they talked about. Um, they think what might have actually had a contributing factor. I don't see why it wouldn't. Was that they talked about? There were soldiers at Fort Riley that were burning horse manure. Now, Fort Riley was a cavalry post, big-time cavalry post. Yeah. Horses produce a lot of manure. Sure. So where's that manure going to go? You can use it for, I guess, sure. the fields for, uh, for fertilizer. But apparently they said that there was a detail where they were burning manure, and this yellow, sickly smoke cloud got up into the air. You could see this from all over the place, and it was burning so hard it kind of blocked out the sun. I imagine people that are standing downwind of this yeah, are actually right. breathing, <laughs> inhaling this kind of stuff there. No telling what's in it. If it had the bird virus in it right there, which is very possible, sure. you know, it's, it's an airborne thing now. And now you're inhaling this. Sure. But the bottom line wow. is that the first article that I read, if I can see this here, this was the first indication that something was wrong. It wasn't the Army that was admitting this. This was a civilian worker who was working at Fort Riley who was from Abilene, which is 20 miles away from Fort Riley, just down the road right there. But it said, uh, November 1st of 1917, the Abilene, Kansas newspaper says, uh, reports that men are dying at Funston untrue. An Abilene man who was working at Camp Funston said Sunday that men are dying at the camp every day. He said that he has seen the men being carried from the camp, the Junction City Union newspaper says. 
And so this is what this guy was observing, and so then I start checking it out. November 7th, six days later, the Topeka Journal says in bold headlines, Topeka die, or Topekan dies in dread epidemic at Camp Funston. Mm -hmm. so that's in one week. So they already admitted in one week that there was this epidemic. So this was the first breakout from November 17 to March 1918. Now we know with the flu that you got different seasons. A lot of that stuff brings it on, different cold, mm -hmm. temperature changes, and things like that, right? But even though this was severe, this is what happened. A lot of these troops that might have been carriers, they probably were, and they just weren't infected right away, they went overseas. And they carried this stuff with them to the trenches over in Europe. That's why it kind of died off, because by, by the winter time, from uh, November, December, January, February, after that it kind of died off. It starts picking up again in March, as we're going to see, of 1918. So this is contributing, not only that, but the, the conditions in the trenches are contributing to the influenza becoming a pandemic, meaning worldwide now. It's not just located or isolated in one country. So by autumn 1918, this is what's going on in a lot of camps. The second wave is starting. And this is what I'm reading in a lot of these newspapers. It's not in the civilian population as much yet, but you're reading about these different camps, not just Fort Riley, but New Mexico, Massachusetts, all these army camps, that you're finding people that are dying. Or they're having an epidemic. They're sick. The Great Lakes Training Base uh, in Chicago, there are like 2,500 naval recruits that are reported sick with this flu epidemic. And by September, this is what you're reading in the newspaper. And it's just crazy how it takes off because August, yeah, you type in the word influenza looking on some of these newspapers online, you'll find a couple hits. But by September, it's just boom, it explodes. And the main place that you see it <coughs> is Boston. For some reason, Boston was like seemed like an epicenter. Maybe it was because it was such a large city. Ships are coming in there. Yeah. I don't know, but Boston keeps coming up in the newspaper repeatedly about the number of people that are dying every day there. But then you got the camp influenza kills a hundred in Boston. The Red Cross needs uh, nurses today. Influenza spread down here in Alabama. Washington, the flu, the surgeon field for the Surgeon General at that time. <coughs> So this is what's happening by September, so it's starting to pick up speed. And these were some of the government suggested ways that were coming out to prevent influenza or try to treat the virus. This picture down here with the children, they said this was a thing that if you gargle with, I don't know if they had Listerine or salt water or whatever, <laughs> gargling was supposed to help prevent that from getting in your throat. But the common thing, you know, this is what we talk about today. You know, it's kind of common sense. You know, if you're going to sneeze, cover your mouth. You know, wash your hands and things like that. This was the stuff that they were actually telling the public. Or wearing masks, because they knew it was airborne. You know, if you're breathing on someone, you know, if you're in a closed room, that's how it was being spread, contact with someone who was infected. Meanwhile, back in Galactica. <laughs> now, the impression that I got when I started reading this from the Nugget was that... There was a lot of complacency going on, and I think it was not intentional. I think it was because when we go back and we see in newspapers that it's in Boston, it's in New York, it's in these army camps, that's well away from us. We're down here in Dahlonega, we're isolated up here in the mountains, you know, we don't have to worry about something like this being so bad. We're kind of safe where we're at down here, you know, it's not going to come to us. And so, this is what they're reading in the newspapers. Estimated there are 50,000 cases of influenza in just Massachusetts alone. This is in October 4th. And because of the epidemic of Spanish flu, the effect has affected the call, the draft of 140,000 men. The war's not over yet. You know, they're still sending people to go to these camps there. Now that would have a psychological effect on anybody who was being drafted or planning to go enlist to go to one of these camps that, hey, if I'm reading all these camps got the flu, I might not want to go. I might just have to skip out. But what was in interesting was that barely noticed was this article about Frank Duff, who's been sick with the fever for a few days. They mentioned it, but just kind of in passing. Didn't really make a big deal about it. But Frank Duff became the first influenza citizen to die. He's buried at Mount Hope. Strangely enough, he is the only one who died from the influenza that's buried at Mount Hope from this time frame. There's one that comes later, but that was after the main uh, epidemic that kind of passed by. But Frank was only 27 years old. Mm -hmm. Nice head. He says he's only 27 years old. Died on October 5th, 1918. 
Now, it's interesting because it doesn't, you know, I tried to look and see, okay, was there some kind of connection with, you know, was there somebody else that he might have been in contact with, associated with, whatever, that also got sick and died? I don't know. So, maybe it was just a fluke. I don't know what business he was in, but somehow he caught this from somewhere. And then, the pale rider comes calling. What is the one thing that brought so much influenza to Lumpkin County Delilah? That's the lunch. The fair. Okay. Let's all go to the fair. They knew this was out there. They knew this was out there. And this was even in, you'll see in later articles, that they blamed the fair for this. A whole week. And this has been like a traditional, an annual event. People want to go to the fair. You know? And I, I see this picture. Of, whoops. I see this picture of all these people. If that was an accurate representation of the fair in Gainesville, it was a big thing. You know, it's like going to the county fair. You want to take your produce, you want to take your livestock, you don't get a great good price. You know, it's fun. But nobody thought that the, 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 the flu was going to be down here because they kind of played it down. The week after, this is what was reported. There was a long article. I just cut, you know, the interesting part right there from the nugget. Talked about Gainesville and the fair. So Townsend, the editor for the nugget, was talking about all the great things about the fair and that he saw and so forth. But what was most interesting, it says, highlighted, passing many of Lumpkin County citizens with their wagons loaded with cotton and other products from the farm. Yeah. So all everybody's taking their wagons, you know. There's no radio at this time. There's no television, obviously. So they don't know what's going on outside of Dahlonega. And so I think also that was another reason that so many people, unfortunately, died in Lumpkin County was because at this time, if you didn't get the newspaper and you lived out in the county, where would you get your information from about what was going on? Maybe a local store, if they had you know, local grocery stores or something like that out there. So news wouldn't have traveled very far out there in the county. But it's interesting that, that as we go on, we see that in, in, in Dahlonega itself, since that's kind of the epicenter of the county, with the town and so forth, less people actually died in town than out in the county. And I think there was a reason for that. But a warning does appear that some parents have quit sending their children to school here for fear of catching the influenza. It's a good plan. No part of an education is of any benefit to a dead person. This is from the October 18th issue of the, the Nugget. Nothing else really mentioned in that article, or that, that issue, and it's a week after the fair was over with. But now comes the next week. This is what happened the week after. So many articles. This isn't even all of them. This is just the ones I thought were the most important. This, and this to me was sort of like, maybe this was a common attitude. We told some of those in power that we thought they ought to close out the schools last week when there was but a few cases of sickness, but they disagreed with us, saying the good Lord put us here and didn't think there was any danger of it spreading. This is true, but when the Lord put us here, he expects us to do our part. Yeah. So when the college bell rang on Monday, 67 boys were too sick to attend. The college was suspended and the boys quarantined. And so they even admit the Gainesville Fair gave widespread to the influenza. And then he goes on to talk about Mr. Wilkes Loggins and his children rode with people with it. But as soon as he got home, he mixed up some sulfur and water with enough whiskey to slip to uh, <laughs> keep it from, to keep keep it from it souring, sweetened with syrup. All had been using it, and none of the family had been taking the disease yet. <laughs> Jack Strickland came back from the severe case of the flu, but by staying close to home, he's gotten his smile back again. Bless his heart. <laughs> Down here, the professors and ladies do not forget about the school boys during their confinement. So they've got quarantined. And we met Professor Camp on the street last Tuesday, who said he had visited 65 of the boys at the dormitory and was going down to the hall building. There was eight sick there. And he told us he understood there were 10 down at the Mountain Inn. So the, the cadets, the students at the college, they were housed in different places around town. So as you can see, each place had a number of you know, the students that were sick. Remarkably, none of them died, though. None of the cadets died. That was an interesting thing. Mr. Ed Roberts left for Savannah to accept a job. There's 2,500 cases of influenza in Savannah at this time. And they talked about people in Chesapeake that have influenza. This was the most important there. Maybe it could have taken place a little bit earlier to be more effective, but the city basically made a resolution uh, to close down all public gatherings, church, um, schools, and so forth indefinitely 
until the epidemic has passed. So that was a good thing. And they said that, um, where's the good part here? No minor children under the age of 15 shall be allowed on the streets of Dahlonega or any other public place in the city except by the permission of the mayor. And anybody in violation shall be punished as prescribed in the section, I think it's 159 of the general laws of the city of Dahlonega. So basically, you know, it's, it's basically, you're not just quarantined, but you're, uh, you know, martial law is being implemented right here. You don't want people walking around necessarily out there. And the next week, this is what really made it bad, especially people out in the county. There was heavy, heavy rain to the point that a lot of the creeks and, and, and I don't know about the rivers, but the creeks for sure were swollen and, and almost flooded, so people couldn't move back and forth. So as it says, this uh, Newt Satterfield came in to get a physician, but found Dr. Head here and uh, Dr. Cantrell, the only two doctors, were sick. They were sick too and impossible to get out. So basically, these people out there in the county, you're on your own. You know, nobody can get to you, you can't get to them. And the doctors are sick too. So that really kind of complicated the situation as far as the number of people that uh, died at this time because they couldn't get any type of medical care whatsoever. Well, how much could they do for you in any event? What could a doctor do? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing because even though they didn't have any type of antibiotics or really good stuff, I think the sanitary conditions really played a part in that, you know, because they're finding that when and people are isolated no in, in individual beds and, and, and kind of separated from groups right there, they tend to recover better rather than if they're just kind of stuck into an open area. And I have to assume a lot of houses, you know, out in the county, they might have been like an open type, you know, layout there. So the, the germ pool would be like all over the place. But at least you're isolated. Do what? At least you're isolated, though. Exactly. And as far as that sulfur, we laugh at that, but sulfur, drugs, the first antibiotics, are made from sulfur compounds. Yeah. So that may have yeah. had some validity to it. It might have. Um, I saw at least three different remedies <laughs> that had sulfur in it. One was even talking about if you put sulfur in your shoes, that it was supposed <laughs> to prevent influenza. Why, I don't know. Was this before or after uh, aspirin? They did have aspirin. They did have they, aspirin. They did have aspirin. They did have aspirin. Yes. That was about the only thing that a lot of people had. Um, this is kind of conflicting in, in, in this regard. There was a few more articles, but I thought these were the two most telling because this one's talking about um, the influenza among the students is almost over and that they're using this asphotia and liquor and tanlac and everything else that somebody comes up with that they read about. And they even talked about wearing a lump of asphotia attached to a string around your neck the size of a kitten's head. Probably because it smelled so bad, nobody wanted to get it. <laughs> but even though they said the cases are kind of going down right now and that they don't want people to congregate in crowds, they also have this article talking about that the city council raised the quarantine so they can have school again. It's like, oh, what are you doing? So these were some of the remedies. They didn't have a cure. You know, nothing that's going to attack the actual causes of the disease, but things that might make you feel better. So if you had a a whooping cough, or you were coughing, or, or a sore throat, or something like that that was contributing to this, it might alleviate some of the pain and discomfort, but it's not going to solve it there. So like at Sally had asked, yes, she did have aspirin at this time. Um, cow tabs, I guess that was supposed to be something for fever, headache, something. But as you can see, a bunch of different things. This one was kind of interesting because it had been around for a number of years. This Foley's Honey and Tar Compound for the throat, chest, and lungs. And this one was in the paper, too, from some French guy that said that um, make a poultice, poultice of six large onions, chopped fine, one pint of apple vinegar, a cup of rye meal. Looks like you're making a recipe. Stew onions and vinegar about 10 minutes, then stir in rye meal, making a poultice thin enough to stir easily on cheesecloth. Bear the chest of the oh, patient yeah. and place the application over the lungs as hot as the face can bear it. Sounds sort of like a big vapor rub in a way. Yeah. <laughs> the vinegar and onions. It doesn't sound very. <laughs> and and I think there might be something to it with some of these home remedies. You know, if these things stink enough, maybe that was the thinking that if you're breathing in the stuff, it's so bad nobody wants to be around you, or it's going to help you. Well, do you remember like those mustard plasters that yes. we had years ago? Uh, when I was back in, when I went back to France when I was seven. Uh, my grandmother would make up these things and she would put it between 
the cheesecloth mm -hmm. and then they put it on your chest or on your back. Yeah. But that was like 1950. I, I think it might be a way to alleviate your your breathing discomfort. Yeah. Like the Vicks Vapor Rub, if you put that on your chest, you're breathing in that menthol type smell. So it's trying to you know make it easier for you to breathe and sleep. Makes you want to get well. Well, they make a tent also. They'd have a great big, like, uh, I'm just talking about what they used to do over there. Mm -hmm. But it was a, like a, a large bowl of boiling water. Mm -hmm. And then they'd put these herbs in the water. And they'd, you know, you put your head over that. And then they'd put a towel over your head. But you had to get out of there every once in a while. I still right. do that, though. Do you? Oh, absolutely. Oh, that's great. You water, you put certain things in it. Yeah, yeah. And it opens your sinuses. There you yeah. go. Yeah, it's a lot great. of that old stuff is. And then a shot of Jack Daniels. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I noticed there's a lot of alcohol involved in like uh, quiet <laughs> remedies, like snake oil salesmen. Yeah, yeah. Sad, um, but we've noticed this also. Um, parties from the county went down to Gainesville and Dawsonville <laughs> to get a coffin, but they couldn't find one. There were so many people that were dying, they yeah. could not get coffins. I've seen pictures of this in, in different places where coffins are just stacked up yeah. all over the place and they, they couldn't find them because it was so <clears throat> intense. And But the influenza took on a new start down on Park and Chesney Street. So it's like a tug of war all of a sudden here. You got some dying off and some, or um, the flu stopping or getting less and less in some areas, but other places it's starting up. So I think what's happening is that this false sense of security where it's over now. We can start having school again. Mm -hmm. There's one person, two people, who knows, that are still infected and they're still spreading. Mm -hmm. So instead of, you know, waiting a long period of time, they're anxious to kind of get things going and resume a normal uh, way of life. In the middle of all this, November 11th happens and the armistice comes. So the end of World War I. Great. You know, we're supposed to be happy. We're rejoicing because the end of the war, we can go back to peace. But we're in the middle of this epidemic right here. Again, they talk about the disease would not have been as bad had people not gone to the Gainesville Fair, when the people attending, not knowing that there was a single case of it in the city, when it had just begun breaking out, we can't be too careful. So I'm not, I'm not sure what that's supposed to imply. Did people at Gainesville know that there was flu and they should have postponed or stopped the fair or something? I don't know. But the college, the moving picture show at the college started up again last Saturday night, we regret to say. This means more flu. Because there are still cases of it in town. So the college had a moving picture show. They had, they had their own like, small little theater or something there on, on the campus someplace. They show moving pictures. Something for the public to enjoy. <clears throat> Not the right time. But now we start seeing a decline from November 16th to the 22nd. People who got the flu here are getting better. Uh, only one new case and so on. And so by the end of November, there's no new cases of influenza that were reported in town, in Dahlonega. But as late as March of 1919, we still see reports and articles in the nugget of people who are still getting sick and dying as a result of the flu or complications. You see pneumonia, whooping cough, other things there, but they're related to this influenza virus. And this is the list that I have come up with of the... 50 plus people who died as a result of the influenza virus. Now, some, I'm sure there's other people that are not on this list that I was able to find. Because the problem I had when researching this through the Nugget articles was that it might say that the small infant child of Mr. So and so died out in the western part of the county last week. Don't have a name, don't have a specific date, don't have a cemetery where that person's buried at. So, I was not unable to find where some of these uh, residents were, were actually buried at. Or if, in fact, they actually did die. Some didn't die here, but were buried here. But uh, it's interesting because I started going through it. Yeah. And uh, you'll notice the age range. Mm -hmm. it, it's kind of, in some ways, it's all over the map. Obviously, you have a lot of small children, in infants, which is really sad. Um, and then you've got other ones like this lady here, Mary Kendall. She was 62 when she died. You know, and you wouldn't think that, you know, well, we talked about it earlier a little bit that the older generations weren't as susceptible. But, you know, maybe her immune system was already compromised and so that might have killed her. I don't know. Um, but you see a couple of these, the early ones, they died at the camps. I said that Frank Duff was the first one that died in Dahlonega, and that's true. He was the first one in Dahlonega. Uh, this fellow, Lee Garner, he was our Lumpkin County resident. 
but he was buried at Yellow Creek Baptist, and he died in Murrayville. He didn't actually die in Lumpkin County, so that's why I didn't count him as being the first one. But you notice what's interesting with the dates. A few here and a few there, and the next thing you know, it just boom, it just really takes off right here. So this is as a result of the fair, you know, with these people that, that had something to do with the fair or maybe came in contact with somebody that had gone to the fair. This is the second part of the list. Uh, sadly, you'll notice the last name of, uh, where is it? See the name Kemp, Tillman yeah. Kemp, Child Kemp. There was three of them that died in the family. So this was, you know, families. You know, if they got infected, you know, one, the other, and the other. But the other thing that's interesting that I found too was that you'll notice there's no real consistency with which section of the county, which cemetery, where these people were buried at. You'll notice there's a, a few Wahoo Baptist Church and Nimble Will. But you'll notice Mount Zion Baptist, St. Paul, uh, Mill Creek, Davis. So it's all over the place. It wasn't just isolated into one, you know, or a couple sections of the county. It was everywhere. And as I said, you know, after November, it started to kind of decline. But yet for the whole month of December, the whole month of January, February, you still had people that were dying from the virus right there, all the way up until March. These last four that I have uh, non-confirmed influenza deaths, this was from newspaper articles where it said that these individuals died, but it didn't say how. So I figured, well, it's in the right time range, and they're of the right age for the most part, so it's fairly possible that that's probably what they died from, right, was the flu influenza. How long did that last, approximately, do you know? Oh uh, my God, look at that. <laughs> this is what I was talking about with running out of coffins. This was not around here. I don't know where it was at, but I thought it was a really um, poignant uh, photograph that <laughs> show. Goodness you know, bring, bring it home. This is what people had, you know, probably in the big cities, Boston, New York, Washington, you know, wherever yeah. they would yeah. there, that they would be stacked up like this. What was your question, Mary? Uh, approximately, how long did this last? Is chronologically, what did they anticipate it to be? You know, it lasted for how long? It actually lasted until, um, you know, in the 1919, a little bit in the 1920, but I don't think it was that strain of the virus because, as I said, uh, you know, the flu has different seasons right there. Right, and right. so by the spring, it tends to die off as you start getting into warmer weather, you okay. know, April, May. And so that's why it went right up until March uh, around here. But even looking further in the 1920, you know, and so forth, you know, later news reports or articles from the Nugget to see if there's anything that they mentioned about this, they were very concerned about it, you know, in 1920, because it did run up in the, you know, first part spring of 1919. But even in the newspaper articles later, 1920, 1921, they were very, you know, hey, you need to make sure that you're doing these precautionary measures yeah. to not get the flu, because, you know, this was still fresh in a lot of people's minds, you know, especially the ones that lost people. And sadly enough, we go back here. Um, the second one I said was buried in Lumpkin County or in uh, Mount Hope mm -hmm. is Homer Townsend, 15 years old. This was the nephew wow. of W. B. Townsend. Mm -hmm. Is talking about in the article on uh, when he passed away. It said that uh, he was actually working in the Nugget office printing, and it said you know um, he had been there and he was doing his work, and he went home that night, and the next day he was dead. That was it, just that fast. So. Sad. And the reason I have a question mark about Mount Hope Cemetery is that it has this long write-up about the young man and him passing away and so forth, but it didn't say where they buried him at. I just had to assume it's at Mount Hope because that's oh. where the rest of the towns and family is buried at. So, but that's my presentation. What questions? Do you have?
and they didn't have any clues. But they were trying everything. That's true. And and I think um, that a few years from now, people in the medical field are going to figure out that chemo and radiation is not a good solution. And something else will come up that will save a lot of cancer uh, patients. And my husband currently has cancer, and he can't take chemo or radiation. It completely destroys him, as it does many people. I mean, it's putting poison in your body. So someday, someone is going to say, you know, why were these people putting poison in people's bodies? And yes, it helps a lot of people, but it also harms a lot of people. Mm. It makes you wonder with a lot of these um, remedies that we saw, up there. a lot of people have been using folk remedies for years and years. And I'm sure that's, you know, it still might go on out in some of the parts of the county. You know, now I've read about some of, some of the Foxfire books. But it makes you wonder if they got certain ingredients that have been tried and true, you know, in the past mm -hmm. for certain things that this is what, that was the extent of their knowledge. You know, it worked in the past, we're going to use this again. You know, or maybe we're going to try to modify it somehow because it's going to, um, you know, be more effective if we use some, some other ingredients right there. So it might sound kind of arcane, you know, the stuff that they were using by our standards today, but like you're saying, at that time, that's all they really had to go by. So. I think it used as an argument against destroying native forests, you know, in the Amazon and everything, because we don't know what the plants that are there might have in the way of cures for diseases, current diseases, you know. They, that hasn't been discovered yet. True. And when they keep destroying it, you know, maybe that's the answer. And, and then it's greedy or, or taken them away. Well, well, whatever anybody discovers is it going to be a cure-all for everyone anyway, you know, ever. I mean, there'll, there'll always be that certain percentage mm -hmm. of people that it won't work for, mm -hmm. but hopefully for the most part, it would be great. Yeah. One thing that I read I found kind of interesting before I came tonight, I looked at the Smithsonian CDC and a few other websites just glancing at some things, and there apparently some uh, medical experts that have been researching this think that some of these deaths could be attributed to aspirin poisoning. Believe it or not, that the uh, patent had come off of bare aspirin and that doctors throughout the country were recommending it in grams, not milligrams, but grams of it. And that they think that that might have been further complicating some of this and actually some of the deaths attributed to it. Well, there was one, you go back and find that slide, well, there was one on one of the remedies up there that I found. It actually quinine. Yes, yeah, quinine. Quinine. Yeah. quinine. You know, and that had been used, I guess, for malaria. So again, you know, this is the extent of medical knowledge at the early part of the 20th century out there. So, yes. And one of the side effects of the flu is extreme fever. Mm -hmm. Any other questions, comments? Did anyone have any ancestors that were on the list there that were related to anyone that, that passed away from the influenza? In North Carolina, I'm from North Carolina. Originally. Dan? Some of them. Some of the Davis family. 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 Are they, are they buried at the Davis um, family cemetery out there? I saw the name Gerard on that. I yes. wondered if any, you know, any uh, relatives of Sheriff Gerard. Mm -hmm. so they've been here a long time. Is that not right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The diet people have become more interested in the uh, herbs and things for diets than and along with your food, of course. And then, um, I guess, drugs like that you have today for that. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure I read in the Foxfire series there was a number of different folk remedies from people there. I know Amy Trammell's name yes. was quoted in there quite a bit there, so I'd have to go back and look and see if Amy had a, a, a remedy for influenza or fever. So I'm sure there's something in there. 
Well, well, thank you for coming to, tonight. I talked um, to Ann to the, today, and she said that Amos's grandfather's brother died of influenza. He was a sergeant in the army, and he died in Florida. Oh, wow. Didn't you mention also that Larry Scott had Larry a, Scott had a relative who died. Is he doing all right, by the way? I called him last week. Larry. Robbie knows more. He had he had broken his shoulder. He had fallen and broken right. his shoulder, and right. so he had to get that repaired. And now he's at Chelsea Park and will be there for some time doing therapy. So hoping with any luck, maybe he'll be able to be here for the holiday party next month. But yeah. Larry's our CEO. For those of you who don't know, for the board there. Yeah, so. I believe I did email around how to get in touch with him. They're at Chelsea. You did. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It was a great thing. Thank you. Yeah, and he he said he's had a lot of. Uh, a lot of company, you know, people coming by to see him, and he just really loves it. And he's in great spirits. I think Chelsea Park must be a wonderful place. What, what room is he in again? Do you know offhand? No, but it's in that email. Yeah. If you didn't, yeah, if you didn't well, leave I'm it. sure they probably go to reception. Oh, yeah. 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 Ask for the reception. Yeah. Yeah. It's not that big. No. Because he, and <clears throat> the best way to get in touch with him is to call him directly to his room. Right. And it's like the number plus his room number. Right. So, and they tell you at the front, at the front desk. But he's doing good. He's in great spirits. Yeah. Um, he's thinks he's going to be coming home with some sort of uh, new thing, fangle thing that is you can operate with one hand because you know he's he's been using a walker for a while. Oh yeah yeah. And now he's going to be strapped like this because some of the screws came loose. So oh, I'm taking shit. a little while longer <laughs> to recover. So. Uh, he said that was a discouraging setback, but he's still in great, great spirits. And keeping up with everything.